Hello, everybody. Welcome back. We are here with another episode of The Off Angle, number 21. Really uh, getting through them. I didn't realize we were so deep in, but when I uploaded the last one, you know, we hit 20. It seems like only yesterday we were on uh, double digits, to be fair, Pranogo, but uh, now here we are. Once again, going to be joined by Thorin down towards the bottom there, of course, a returning guest as we are going back through the roller decks, getting the boys involved once again for more uh, Counter-Strike 2 talk, I think it's going to be, you know, see where uh, everything's at on that and pick the brains of the man down below. But uh, I, I always, I, I think I've just, you know, come up with this as uh, a bit of an idea in the past few episodes, just seeing how people are, you know, trying to be a bit of a nice guy. So how, how are things, Thorin? You're always busy, so I'm sure. Okay. The only thing is, I am very much more in sort of the cultural heritage of the UK in that if anyone says, how are you, yeah. even if you're about to die in five minutes, you say, all right. And then that's the end. Of, <laughs> that's like the end of the like social niceties. And then you move on to whatever. Like, If you yeah. don't know, by the way, if you're American and you go to the UK and someone says, how are you? They don't really want to hear 10 minutes about your life. Yeah, you do. Yeah. They just yeah. want you to go, yeah, I'm all right. Yeah. Or, or if you're British, if you, it's really good, the joke is you don't say it's really good. You go, not bad. Yeah. That's actually how you, it's always, <laughs> yeah. you're supposed to be understated. So I'll keep it that way. I'm all right. Mate. I'm all yeah. right. It's all, all good. Right, don't good. worry. That's good stuff. And now now for the American uh, yes. of, of the group. And here's so, exactly you know. how I'm feeling about yeah, all yeah. the things that have happened recently. Yeah. And how it made me feel inside when I woke up and yeah, whatever. Yeah, I'm doing well. Everything's good. We're on a show. We got some stuff to talk about. You know, the, the biggest thing that I wanted to, to sort of hit off immediately is like, we just had EPL obviously finished Grand Slam taken by FaZe. Kerrigan, of course, maybe cementing his legacy as the GOAT IGL. That's something we can discuss. But uh, it looks like the uh, th local authorities might be a little <laughs> bit upset with me. So don't mind the sirens. The, the main thing is... We're looking to close things out, and maybe it's serendipity, maybe it's something just nor you know happenstance. But we get the conclusion to a lot of the storylines that maybe we were locking. L just look back to the last couple of majors. Simple finally got his major. Kerrigan finally gets his major. Kerrigan gets the Grand Slam after like you know oh, it's almost like blue balled for a long amount of time, where it was a very long stretch before they finally cemented it. And you know maybe in in the least like uh, and you know ambitious and momentous event that you could have had asked for, where like at the end they just have. You know, I, I actually know some of these people, but some ESL guys, we can call them, bring out the, the gold bricks. I was kind of thinking that, like, maybe they would go for somebody who is a little bit more grounded in historical CS success. Or maybe one of the last winners of the uh, of the Grand Slam. That would be a cool angle, wouldn't right? it? Yeah, if it was, like, yeah. passing the baton or something. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and even, I mean, the joke, joke is obviously. he could have said, you know, in that scenario, though, you'd never get simple to stick around to do it, would you? If he's oh, not yeah, receiving it himself. So, you know, just saying. Yeah. The other don't, know if, it, don't know if it's a shock to anyone, but Simple's a bit of an arsehole. Don't know if, don't know if anyone, <laughs> don't know if that snuck, snuck out into the wider world yet or not, but who knows? Yeah, when he stabs you in the back, it's with a knife that isn't his, if you know what I mean. So There you go, yeah. exactly. The, the thing I was thinking of, of course, is that you would want somebody who's like grounded in the local region's history. Like, you know, you, okay. if there's a major in Poland, you'd bring out like a Taz or somebody. But uh, the problem is, obviously, the only Maltese history anybody's really familiar with in CS is Config. He could have brought up the gold bars. That's pretty or, much or just that shit player from Australia. There you go. Indeed. Is Called Malta. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, actually, Malta. It was yeah, a player yeah. called Malta, if you remember. He was, he was, yeah. wasn't super. I think he was playing for like Ground or something, didn't he? Yeah, he was, yeah, yeah. By the way, he probably wasn't that shit relative to Australian city. Just he wasn't relevant to us, obviously. No, yeah. I mean, I didn't even remember he existed. You had to remind me. So there you go. That's a deep cut. No, yeah. So we're getting all these sort of answers and capstone moments to CS history at the same time as CS2 is announced and CSGO's last major is upon us. So, I mean, really, I guess the perfect sort of storyline capstone would be Nico finally getting a major because he's kind of like the last one who's in the running who still hasn't gotten one. I kind of don't feel like that's going to happen. I'm interested in your guys' takes, but Thorin, obviously, as the esports historian, is there anything we're missing before the end of CSGO that would make it the most satisfying other than the obvious Nico pick? Is there something that you can put your finger on as like, this would be a really great storyline if it actually finishes? And how likely do you think that kind of storyline would be? I don't even think the Nico one's actually as good anymore as people think it is. Like, if he'd have won it, obviously the one where him and Simple were in the final, one of them had to win it. If he'd have won it in that context, that would be quite cool, I think. Not least because if you ever look at that lineup, the point is he would have won it there. Like, he would have had to be the best player. That was the one where they still had Jax yes. and Nexa and Damanek all in the same lineup. Like, if he'd have won it there, I'd have said awesome. But the problem is, like, if he wins it now, it's not even a guarantee Nico will be the MVP of the tournament. Of in fact, the joke about this G2 lineup, especially if you saw the one kind of eats it, is he could actually be, like, the third best player and they could win it. So if he wins it like that, I'm not even sure that does fulfill the category of, like, Nico got his major. Because when yeah. we say Nico deserves a major, we mean, like, he was cracked out for years and years. It's like, ah, 
arguably the best player, if not definitely rifler for years and years and years and years. If he doesn't do it that way, I don't know if it works anyway. And then also to me, it's like, it's only because he's actually still active and could win one. Like technically, Elise also be cool if he were on a bench. He's just not very good at the moment. So if you really want to do like the best story ever, it actually probably wouldn't even be an equal. It'd probably be like, fucking Guardian wins a major or the old the old school one is somehow existence won one. He was the one who was like missing one in terms of all the great players and stuff. The problem I have overall is I actually do also think the Nico, I'm not actually sure he does deserve a major anymore. His play deserves a major, but that's not obviously, as we've learned in esports history, what wins your tournaments. There's yeah. things like, do people want to play with you? Can you get the right people into your team? Can you move to the right team? The problem I have with the Nico angle is this. People act like he played in mouse sports his whole career. No, he only played with them for like a year and a half or something. After that, he was in phase and had all the power and opportunity to do anything. You could actually argue Nico, since he was in the, the big phase clan, that was the first like true like international superstar team. You you could argue he actually, if he wanted to, like those NBA players, he could have run the whole scene, bro. He could have brought anyone he wanted in. He could have kicked anyone he wanted out. Sometimes I imply he did. He could have gone to any team he wanted. Remember, he left that team to go to G2 when they looked better and then that team was great. And he's had, I'm sure he's had offers since. So my only problem is, I think like if I take the nameplate off and I just look how he played, yeah, that is a player that deserves a major or you can put it another way. Most players who won majors weren't as good as him. You can put it that way. That would be satisfying. But I also sort of feel like in some ways, if Nico ends his career with a major it'll be a pretty good fucking lesson to young players of like how you manage your career how you deal with teammates sort of when when you did it because he claims he doesn't have any input over his career even if that's true that's a lesson right there don't just leave your career in other people's hands like why would you do that mate because i always say this it's the same reason i used to i've told literally to his face in this story i've told shocks it's not about the fact smith is your friend it's about the fact that at the end of cs go when someone says where's all the majors and mvp shocks you're gonna have to turn to it and go or see my friend Edward here. I just preferred playing with him. Like, that's whack. You know what I mean? Like, you could have been his mate and won all those championships. Why did he have to do that? So I, I, I personally just think in the modern day, especially, you should use the power you have. So I think that would be cool. But I also think there's plenty of, like, not as complete narratives. Like, for example... In some ways, I think it'd also be cool if Simple won a second major or Carrigan won a second major or uh, maybe you even have a mad thing that maybe Liquid just wins bizarrely on the way out the door for no good reason. Everyone says it's a fluke, but spoilers, Cloud9 fans have shown us. It doesn't matter if people say it's a fluke. You yeah. still won. You can still go on about it for endlessly for years. So I think there's a lot of narratives that could end here. The joke is it would almost just suck if it was actually just like another outsider's like it's just a fluke went out of nowhere <laughs> and then we all get blue balls right at the end of the game and no one gets like the satisfying end right <laughs> i think it, it's Good it's answer. set up it is set up kind of nicely though i'm I'm sort of in agreement that i think a better uh storyline for it would definitely be you know a navi or uh a a, a phase win because i think that you know yeah. they they have the conversation around you know their their key players right carrigan with the goat igl it would cement i think there'd be no argument now a couple majors right uh glaive would unfortunately with where the teams ended up these days be sort of out of that picture um and then simple i think despite everything you know the the world situation and and whatnot um but at the same time it would just again solidify the fact that he's the goat of the game and, i mean in uh, some ways the world situation make it even more baller if he won yeah, now right sure, make, sure. It, make it seem even sicker yeah yeah yeah, yeah. so I, I do feel like you know having having i think simple would probably be the best because then there'd just be absolutely so. no argument that yes. he was kind of the the goat uh, in in many different forms, let's say, right, where you have the individual player dragging the team through, and you know a very poor sort of team around him. Then he gets all the players in the right place, and uh, they manage to make it work. And you know they have this individually driven team, and it's the best looking. We get robbed of a bit of an era of them, but at the very least, at the tail end, we'd get shown that simple and electronic as well. You'd have to kind of have in that conversation are some of the you know world ending players. And when we do, hopefully, some sort of hall of fame after this game will start to you know uh make itself known and we can start adding a few you know we've just had taz retire and whatnot so uh, i think it's a good opportunity to start getting some of the older players into the hall of fame and then we can have these conversations around you know not just the the greatest player of all time but we can we can add all the little accolades to to different players like a shiro like an axile or whatever that you know their their hall of famers in their own right um but yeah i think that it is a, a better storyline to come through that someone like simple finding uh the the major with everything that's going on in his world and also just the fact that they will have been able to rebuild the navi team and that uh we can see that navi are as as strong as we say they are and i i do feel you know uh in a new zone in the final major of the game it's going to be hyped up because of that reason right that we have 
uh, a different system coming in it looks like as well you know with only maybe one major we'll we'll see um at least it's going to be earlier next time so maybe not maybe it does open to more but you know i i think that it will the game is obviously changing and and i think that that therefore might change some of the fabric of the players so it'd be good to have a fully cemented kind of story uh at the end of of CSGO. If we get another one of those fluke wins, I think it will take, you know, some of the uh, the gravitas out of this major and the gravitas out of the end of the game, you know. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of in agreement. I think that a, a simple double header would be very, very cool. Uh, but again, Carrigan, maybe he also finds it. And I think that that would start to you know, look towards a team like FaZe as one of the probably best teams of the game. Um, and in indeed getting again, you know, the individuals together in such a uh, weird and wacky kind of way and, and having those individuals re-perform and come back up and have this uh, swan song towards the tail end of Go would be very cool. By the way, you know, Scriv, no one even thinks about that angle because this is where you can tell. The problem with narratives is... Because narratives have like archetypal components to them where you've heard a similar story many, many times. And so essentially what we're discussing here is really like if you rephrased it, it's like what would the most satisfying sort of end to the story be if this was like a children's story? And, you know, at the end you want a message and you want like things that happen during the story, the journey to somehow tie into the end of the story. Right. So it's all neat and it feels right. Well, along those lines, like when you talk about those aspects, one thing I think people really miss is because the narrative around Carrigan was he's a choker and he never wins anything and they don't win the big tournaments. They've done the same thing they did with Simple before he won his major. I had to point this out to people right before they won the major. You know, he'd won everything else, right? He already had his kind of eats in his cologne. I think he had a couple of, of like the kind of eats of You know what I mean? He'd already won other tournaments and you looked, it's only the major he didn't have. Because remember, he even had the Grand Slam by the time he got to the, to, to go to win the major. So the problem is because the whole logic was he doesn't win the major. People did the same thing with Carrigan. So what people haven't noticed is this, because there was the big gap where they won the first tournaments, then there was the gap and they won Cologne, and then that was it until now. FaZe only just won again now. People haven't kept track that if you add it all, all up, right, so they won Canavitze, Cologne, a major, Grand Slam, Dude, if they win another major, now FaZe also is in contention for like best team to ever play Counter Strike. Yeah. They're already like a top 10. Dude, they would be contenders for best ever. Think about what that would also do to the Carrigan story as well. Like he also had the best team. And remember, I don't make this logic. I don't even subscribe to it, but everyone else does. So I'm going to say it. Y'all are the ones who act like every second that passes on a clock, everyone gets more skilled in the world and gets more next level. And every time someone wins a game, everyone apparently is just some boffin doing all their homework, leveling up. They're not, of course. I watch fucking G2 just sit there with guns shooting people and then they're just winning games but I'm supposed to believe everything's next level fucking 500 7,000 G you know dimensional Jenga at this point in time and everyone in 2015 apparently is just some bonehead just default like, it's just nonsense but if you believe that how the fuck are you going to argue against the guy winning all the shit at the end of the game when we're already 10 years deep when in theory by that logic everyone had a chance to study Astralis and then that means by your own logic guys you'd be the GOAT lineup you'd be the GOAT player you'd be the GOAT IGL like I don't make the rules if we're going to make that sort of standard then we have to do that right so I, I don't I think that person would go too far but I would say it'd be just like the Glaive versus Carrigan it'd be a great convo wouldn't it the prime Astralis yep. prime Fnatic prime phase let's have that battle off obviously Richard already did the time travel lab, but if you did another one of those it'd be pretty interesting if they win a second major right that that sort of throw a different wrench in there I think and you can't even count Navi in this conversation either because they've obviously had a different lineup between their previous major and even if they win this major on the way out, it doesn't make any further stake. You know, maybe it increases Simple's greatness, obviously, but it's not going to increase, you know, uh, it'll increase Blade's greatness, maybe some of the other players like Electronic, obviously, but you're not really going to up the stock of Navi as the, the best team because obviously they're a very different team now. It's like you say, it's mainly Blade, I feel like, would gain the rep aside from Simple because logically what you would say for Blade is like, Bro, he won two majors without anyone people consider a great in-game leader. That should be impossible. Remember, yeah. he did it in the era when the like, the, idea, the coach can speak like twice and a half. Like that would be pretty amazing if he managed it. Yeah, I mean, looking I pretty far away from that right now, though. I will say it's, looking, course, yeah. it's not looking like they're going to win it right now, is it? <laughs> That's the one thing that would be super satisfying about a simple doubleheader is that he's looked to have a down year, maybe one of the most down years in recent history. Obviously, still putting up. If you actually look at his stats, it's not the, like you you say it all. Did the you time know Bruno go? 
if people are fans, I'm going to do like a Marvel okay. comics from the 60s here. If you check out issue 11 of yeah. Prologo and Friends, yeah. I was actually on the last time I came on this show. I gave that whole soliloquy about how actually, even though like I despise him as a person, you could actually like have mad respect for Simple, the fact that he's been able to battle through all this stuff and about how all the weight... And, you know, I did that whole thing about how like, wouldn't you feel like you'd been robbed if everything was given to you finally, you're on top, you couldn't lose a land, and then some totally like external thing happened that destroyed your team and tore people. I made that whole thing there and the thing is, I was just like building a case, but me, it's, it's turned out to be accurate. Like his game just tanked after that. It was like not even that long after that. It just started going, like the line just tracks down and down and down. That's why at the end of last year, I kept making the point to people. Guys, I don't think you know how far it's gone. Like it's not even that he's just like not the best player. Like if you had a look, he's not the best CIS player. He's not the best op. Dude, he's not, he's just not the best anymore. Like he's, he's start, he's like gradually playing himself back in the form. Now I feel like the last couple of tournaments, I feel he's had some big performances, but it's actually kind of wild because that that was actually a pretty whack year for Simple, even though he did end up number one, like justifiably. But it's not you can't really compare those to the prime Simple years. I mean, he used to even in a loss, he used to dominate. You know. Yes. Yeah. Now you you almost need a bit of a perfect storm to for him to catch yeah. fire in the same way. It's not going to happen by by default anymore. It can't be. I mean, it's weird because obviously, like you were talking about, the almost like the lag time of the narrative updating, and that's exactly what's going to happen. Where Simple is going to be expected to put up these monster performances, yep. and even though he's not really been doing that super consistently lately, I, and maybe we're you know like we obviously as pundits as analysts, we always run the risk of like jumping off the train too soon, and it's really weird to try to jump off the Simple train given what he's done. But uh, I'm just saying, you know, like maybe consider your exit plan if you're still on that train, just because it could happen. He could just totally dud out at the end of CS:GO, which would obviously be a black mark on an otherwise very remarkable career literally the best player to ever play the game i think he's pretty much the goat player that you can have for csgo specifically you can maybe try to make arguments here and there but it's just nobody else has the longevity even device who would be maybe the other candidate is like i mean zywoo was too soon device had that off year where he just totally didn't play a tier one cs and even now i mean he's playing in astralis he looks okay in that system but like Come on, guys. It's Astralis. Like, you know, they're not going to be doing numbers or damage at this major at all. So, although if they did somehow, you know, you were talking about a miraculous liquid win. If Astralis do a miraculous win at, with the last major, maybe that helps Glaive's case a little bit, but it just doesn't seem possible at all. At this that didn't happen a bit. Yeah. <laughs> I did, I, that wasn't even worth the time it took you to say that out loud. So <laughs> I, I, I just knocked out of the NFL, you bit. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, yeah. I, I think. Uh... Glaive and Zonic, maybe uh, we have to look to that kind of pairing. I don't think that, you know, Glaive, unfortunately, mm. on his own is really oh, yeah. uh, doing an well, awful Well, independently, lot. right? Because Zonic is doing nothing on Vitality. Well, yeah, that's Gilded. true, actually. That's so. true. Maybe the match made I actually heaven. think the two pairings that people always made, but then bizarrely, they don't judge these people when they're apart, is Glaive and Zonic and Cold Zero and Fallen. Look when these people are together and they look when they're apart. It's night and day, mate. Which isn't to say any of them are frauds. It's pointing to you. The combo was obviously what was awesome, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The combo, the timing, I think as well. You know, they they uh, the sort of twenty eighteen post phase era and everything was uh, pretty flat. So there's there's a lot there for the Astralis boys to to unpack. Um, something I wanted to talk about a little bit while we're you know on on the end of CS:GO and and all this kind of stuff. Um, I'm I'm very curious how you feel. Maybe the the hard swap. Um, the fact that we're getting CSGO into CS2, because obviously you had time in 1.6 and then, you know, had time in Go. Um, and for a while there, there wasn't as many players coming across. There wasn't as many teams coming across. They stuck with their game. Do you feel this is a better way of, of doing it for Valve that they've, you know, pulled through, uh, like I say, yeah, the hard swap, I suppose, the hard change, rather than having two games compete against each other and let one sort of grow naturally and, and whatnot because it does mean that cs2 is going to have to be a pretty perfect product if it's going to be played at all levels of the game and you know you're not going to have the option to go back to go um yeah. even as a casual player that might be something that you miss uh so yeah how do you how do you feel about that change coming in thorn the problem I have with this whole deal, and no one else seems to have this issue. Everyone else just seems fine, sort of like with the cognitive dissonance. Like the question always was when I heard this announcement of CS Go because CS Two, because I always heard that thing behind the scenes, especially for people like Richard, which is like I'm almost certain they won't fuck with the skins. You know, they'll migrate and all that. Yeah. It's like the first assumption would be. Well, logically, in the same sense, what you, the reason Counter-Strike Global Offensive is successful is the way the game plays and certain aspects of the gun mechanics. So the same concept, right? If you don't want to risk all of that 
and risk just tossing it away and becoming a shit game, you're going to have to migrate most of that. So as far as I can tell, the part I don't get is this. I don't have CS2. I don't play it. So from what I've observed watching people stream it and the initial announcement, it seems to me like it is just CSGO with like an engine update. It's got some interesting graphical aspects. Seems more like the graphical components that changed. But when he watched the guns, like I'm not surprised when people put those clips like, Nico dominating CS2. You watch it. It's just a bang average normal Nico clip where he just shoots people in the head with the AK. Like, that's just what he does every game. That's a CS go with smoke grenades, you know, and a lava lamp in Dust 2 spawn. Like, okay. Like, what is it really that different? So the weird thing I don't get is this. If it's not that different, aren't we all sort of like over-egging the pudding with all this shit? Like, and it's CS2. It's not really. It's just like you say, they just got rid of CS go, rebranded it as CS2, gave everyone to it for free, remember, if you have CS go, yeah. and it's just an update on the engine. Like, if it's that, it's not that big a deal. And hopefully... All the people who are good are still good, by and large. And maybe you get the odd person. I would say I think it'll only be the odd person come to the game because it's CS2. I don't actually get the vibe, personally, by the way, that there's going to be some great exodus from Valorant and Overwatch and all Call of Duty and that everyone's going to be on CS Go. No, no, don't worry. It'll be like when games get launched in the first week, like Apex Legends. Yeah, there'll be a bunch of streamers will be all over it, of course. There'll be a bunch of events where people from different games play for charity and stuff. But I'm pretty sure within three months, it'll just be back to CSGO. And if you are in CSGO before, you'll be in CS2. And if you weren't, you'll fuck back off to whatever game you want for clout or fame or the little bit of essentially just to abuse the Twitch discovery mechanics so you can be top of that category for the one week where everyone will be streaming it before they go back to Valorant. But if you'd actually done the real one, which is you had really made a sequel, as CS2 implies, it was a totally different game, but with, you know, core concepts that are similar, like 1.6 to CSGO, which is a pretty radical jump if people don't know. If you did that, look, I'd give you props because it's way more ambitious and bold. And by the way, that could be where you actually might get people from other games to come in and you could totally rechange the whole scene and maybe it could be bigger and maybe it could be the biggest game in the world especially if you did all the publishing correctly in china and all the different asian countries that you need to have all the pc bang networks if you did all that it'd be massive but the problem then is you also risk the fact that like there's a world for real where even like simpler nico might just not be the best players in the next game if people can't comprehend that by the way if you think to yourself but they're aim low this guys you don't know how good people like trace and neo were at 1.6 they were simple and nico and when they came to cs go they weren't just not not that good the joke is like it would be like if i told you like, this isn't the case but like smiths was supposedly like a very good sauce player but imagine if he was the goat of sauce but then in csgo his career was the same and he was like a laughing stock and people why is he still in teams that would actually make you eventually question the game, right? Which is, why can't he be good at the game if I know he was amazing at another game? So I just feel like people are sort of falling between the two. They're acting like it's a new game, but they're so assured nothing's going to be lost from the past and we're only going to gain fans, attention. It's going to get bigger as a game. So I'm kind of a bit concerned because as far as I can tell, it's, isn't it the former? Isn't it just essentially like a bit of a tweak on CSGO? And if anything, I think people are just happy Valve's giving us attention and they're doing things in the game and all that jazz. But the way this part is no one even seems to mind that they're not fixing any of the things we don't like they're not fixing the economy nope. they're not fixing any of the things with any of the weapons they're not actually doing any of the things you all asked for so i just find it to be a weird spot mate like i'm actually sort of a bit assured that i feel like it is just cs2 with a new liquor paint a slightly different sort of circumstances and lighting and some vi visual graph so i kind of like that dude because i like cs go i don't want to risk it i don't want to like, if, if it was one of those game shows, like, what do you want? Do you want to go for the mystery box or stick with CSGO? Like, I'll just go bank. I'll, t I'll take CSGO. You can have the mystery box. That could be, like, fucking Roblox or something, mate. Like, I wouldn't <laughs> risk it personally. So, I don't know. Are you guys actually on the vibe that you think it's going to be, like, do you think it's going to change the scene? Is it going to be a big game changer? Um, Maybe I, there's an angle I haven't got. Yeah, I, I don't know. I think from a casual sense, we'll not dwell on that too much. From a casual sense, I think it'll do a pretty good job to, you know, bring more people because that's just the way that the marketing is at the moment. You know, you have a new a new game, a new skin or whatever and, and everyone gets excited for it. And sure. again, whether that's oh, I'm nearly thinking or, of esports, you know, of course. I'm just yeah, I'm, right, you have to right, remember right. I'm just completely siloed in the esports yeah, one. Yeah, that yeah, is the world sure, to me. For sure. <laughs> um but yeah, in, in terms of the esports side, I, th I think the smoke change will be pretty big, to be honest with you. I think that um, you know, it's gonna we're we're in a bit of a um rotation meta with that kind of thing you know the maps like overpass and inferno are very repetitive because of the smokes i think that they'll still kind of have a degree of, of repetitiveness to them but i i do feel that because you know the the sort of the holes that come up when you spam and everything i think that that'll make a big change to the ct side and uh well both sides to be fair on sort of these spam wars that happen for uh the first sort of 30 seconds of the round and i i do think that that'll have a relatively big change um 
But I, I don't know. I'm kind of agreeing with you uh, again. I think that, you know, this is, uh, you know, more of a visual change, more of a uh, graphical kind of update just to bring it to the, the Source 2 engine. That's one of the big things as well is the fact that the Source 2 engine is easier to edit around. So we might get more frequent updates. We might get bigger changes and things like that. Um, but I think in terms of the way that the game functions and the gunplay, it does feel very similar and you've got a lot of the same players finding success. We might get, yeah, a sort of 16 to 21 year old bracket where it's like they were playing Valorant for a bit and they decide to come on to CS2 because it's something fresh. We get a couple new pro names that you've not heard of and, and this kind of thing, but that's sort of happening uh, most of the time anyway. So, um, I, I don't know that it's really going to change up the fabric of the game. The, the thing is, we're obviously still in the early test of it and maybe maybe they do bring in something pretty substantial uh further down the line once they feel like the game is more stable because i think that's obviously what they're after at the moment is just making sure that the game functions properly and uh do away with some of the bugs and and things like this um but i don't know if they change uh, a gun here or there if they you know indeed do maybe buff a, an a4 or something like that but we have uh, i think towards the end of go one of the key things to talk about is that we have got to a meta where it's kind of solved right with the saving um with the the changing around of the guns especially the a1s though you know tends to be uh relatively stagnant to be honest um and it even feels towards the tail end of the game here anubis as a map adds this in but towards the tail end of the game we're getting a bit more t-sidedness out of things because teams have just kind of figured that it's like right we'll just get them to rotate their utility and have a, a pretty conventional start the cts have to stick to a script to a certain degree so they just kind of wind down the clock for a minute and and you know then they start to make their move later on into the round so it has left the game a, a little stale i think which um is is kind of problematic maybe a new game will change that up but i'm not so sure i think something like the economy needs a big shake up um and maybe in an interesting way maybe you have to think about it a bit harder sure you know we've had two very simple looking economies where one stacks up one doesn't you know it's it's not too deep maybe things change uh based on on how you survive if you you know survive in a round you get more money or uh whatever something needs to change economically i think for for a real shake up in the meta because that seems to be the big problem at the moment but yeah i i don't think there's going to be uh too big of a change um but We'll, we'll, well just see. look at how we'll the see. way that Valorant changed the formula of CS. I mean, they have like the randomized spray pattern shit or whatever, which is just whack. I don't understand how anybody can get behind that because it just changes all the time. I mean, I guess you're testing like, I don't know, you're it's like a fidget spinner or something, you know, like this, at the risk of like deviating into a rant about Zoomer psychology. <laughs> I, I like, for example, I can't believe that actually telling people to like this video and subscribe to the channel if you enjoy the content is even actually successful. Like surely if Probably you watch it is the content, thought, it's the thing. Oh yeah, it, yeah. That, it's super successful, yeah. but I don't understand how because surely you understand that you're watching content you like it you're gonna hit the like button you're gonna at least subscribe because you want to know where more content comes from but no everybody gets their content from the algorithm instead of like curtailing their own list and curating their own stuff but whatever uh, the, the main thing that i look at with valorant is that a lot of the changes that they made you know they made the colors all flat and bright and detailed lists and now you can just see stuff for pure visibility all the time they made it so that like uh, okay, you know, Peeker's Advantage, they had this whole spiel about how they solved that, even though they didn't actually solve that. Obviously, their maps are a joke, but, like, you look at the the fundamental changes that they took to the platform, they, they basically looked at what everybody was complaining about with CS, where they have, like, 128 tick servers in matchmaking instead of Valve's 64 tick, and it's like, let, let's just take everything that people don't like about the other games, and let's, like, do a very bare-bones fix. So what they did, for example, is, as far as I'm aware, if you die like in a clutch situation, basically saving is very heavily discouraged in Valorant. And I don't exactly know the mechanism by how they do that, but I know that it basically is a very one dimensional thing where you pretty much never want to save. Is that, is that accurate to your guys' understanding? If you guys are aware, I think it so. just seems I mean, like I you're just never, never able to save in that game. At least I've never, never watched a, a Valorant clip where like the yeah, defense right, team same. is actually I mean, saving. I know one thing they changed in the modern day in Valorant is they essentially did kind of like when we got the CZ and the Tech Nine and CSGO and they have like OP pistols. Mm -hmm. So essentially they have one one that's like that that basically like everyone fought, sort of like mini forces with so i think okay. essentially like, it's a bit like what you're saying Pernogo, because it implies that you just go for it and then you use that gun to get back in the game anyway a bit like why they made the cz so op to make people feel like you didn't save two rounds and all that crap you know one thing though that i find really weird is 
People never even bother to talk about that aspect. People contrast like Valorant and CSGO and they ask things like, what's the circuit like? How much money is there? Or they try and take stories like, for example, Tens, if we don't want to look, it was actually a while ago now, it was about two years ago now, but Tens was at one point the best player in Valorant, right? So then the logic will be like, oh, but he was actually like, you know, like on the rise in CSGO and maybe if he just stayed in CSGO, he'd have been really good. Here's the part no one ever talks about and dude, it's crazy. If you've got context, I know you guys must because you're in the talent world and all the talent obviously came from CSGO initially when the game came out. Just try reaching out to some of your talent who are friends and ask them, especially if any of them were pros, by the way, just ask them privately. You have to do it privately, mate, where no one can see and no Riot Games is watching. Ask them what they think of the gun mechanics of Valorant. To a man, I have never met a single former CS pro who plays in, in Valorant as a pro or top talent who says that the gun mechanics are better or there's anything they like about them more. All of them imply like the spray aspects is worse they say literally it means like like it sort of evens the playing field for people who start as good with scale and stuff like the, those aspects dude it's almost universally like damning the way they say it. and this is not stuff by the way where I'm saying it to them like yeah you, you play that bloody pussy little kids game well I'm not doing that so they're like placating me I sometimes just generally straight up ask people like do you prefer it like is there actually some things that are better because I'm open to the idea that like there could be some components that are like sure, yeah. different and maybe that's cool in its own way you know I'm not like in some CS zealot in that sense if it's better cool maybe Valve should do it in our game but to a man dude that's like the dirty secret no one tells you about Valorant it's behind the scenes they all think essentially the game is worse they just like the scene like maybe yeah. they didn't like how the NA scene was going in CSGO or maybe they just weren't a top player now they get a chance to be a top player from the beginning remember that's also a massive part as I tried to point out in my video about it a massive part of the impetus of why so many people who are in CSGO industry want CS2 is they think it's like we're taking the Monopoly game and going well that's the end of that game boys and girls now we're going to play risk and you start from zero and they get a chance to be the best so they all think essentially anyone who hasn't succeeded always thinks if you reset everything they'll have a better chance to succeed which in some ways it can be true but usually it's not the reason you weren't succeeding so I just find that shocking because I never see anyone contrast that aspect everyone talks like the games are identical but we're just like computer graphics that are weebish or something they act like all that's different is the maps and the graphics like they're pretty different games guys yes, like they're actually they not that similar when you play them even well, that's where I was bringing up that point is like you, Riot have basically taken a very like basic shallow fix. Like they have a shallow understanding of the problems in CS, probably because they don't play it that much. I, I have a feeling that a lot of the game developers... You know what's wild though? I will say this though, Promogo. I do get the sense though, just from, as an observer, it's pure okay. speculation. I do get the vibe that they actually did succeed though in selling the premise of a CS game to casuals way better than CSGO does. I actually think sure. the problem games like CSGO and Rainbow Six have, unfortunately, is the realism aspect Aspect. When you see, especially like Rainbow Six, which people don't know, it's like a more complicated version of CSGO with what you can do with the utility. When you see that and you're like, if you're a guy who just wants to jump into a game and have some arcade fun, you start thinking incorrectly, like, oh, it's like bloody XCOM or something. I've got to set up a whole tack to you. That sounds boring. You know what I mean? It sounds like everyone's the IGL. It's not true, actually. But if you instead see like Valorant, even though it is still the CS, it looks more like, oh, it's more fun and sort of arcade -y and I'm using like weird silly guns and we're all flying around with powers. Like, that sounds more fun. Like, like I, if you haven't noticed the audience they've attracted in Valorant doesn't seem like it is CSGO people it actually no. is bizarrely people from games like League yeah, yeah. but want to sort of try a new game and so uh, whatever they've done in that regard they've killed it like that aspect they seem to have nailed the marketing because even things like the concept of like even though I, I laughed like everyone did when they just renamed everything like, it's not a bomb it's a spike it's like you know what as <laughs> fucked up as that sounds when I watch people play they almost seem to understand even noobs intrinsically what the premise of the spike dynamic is better than in the random noob German that keeps fucking buying the open Russian B on your matchmaking game in Dust 2 like 10 years into the game like those guys don't seem to have ever grasped the premise of the game you know so I don't know what they did at, at Valve but I'll give them at Riot rather I'll give them props for that angle though. They, they have attracted a different crowd well, also, it, it's funny that you bring up the spike specifically because that's also one of the only things that they changed. It, uh, admittedly, a minor change, but actually something that obviously has interesting uh, ramifications, which is that you can half defuse the spike and then get off of it and start clutching and shooting and stuff. Which is kind of oh, neat. Like, yes, that, that is be, true. Yes, maybe that could be something that CS2 could play around with or whatever. But obviously, the the, the other thing is that it, you know you know this better than most, Thorin, that a lot of game developers at these higher echelon big companies are like holier than thou fart sniffers that don't want oh, to gosh. give credit for anything. 
everything else. So you get into a stage where they're like, well, this is clearly from Valorant because this, or, or you know, like a reaction to Valorant or whatever. And, and if they're just, even though obviously Valorant is copy and pasting a lot of stuff from Overwatch and from CS, especially, they don't ever want to acknowledge that, but at the same time, they want to sell you on the idea that it's like CS, but better or whatever, which is just a weird like cognitive dissonance. Oh, by the way, I'll tell you one person that should get absolutely wrecked. It's the type of person, and there was lords in the industry, like Slash is the classic example, where they would just every two years, they would do a tweet thread like, why don't we rename CT and T and take out the bomb? And Well, here's why, dickhead, because Overwatch and Valorant don't have bombs. They don't have real life guns. So by your logic, they should have way more revenue than all CSGO. They should be shitted on every game, right? Yeah. That was supposedly the one thing we were being told. I don't think it was personally ever true. That was holding back Coca-Cola or McDonald's from sponsoring CSGO. Where are they in those games, guys? They, this is the control group at this point, isn't it? If that works, Valorant should destroy CSGO financially. As far as I can tell, it doesn't seem like it's had any, any impact, does it? Like, isn't it just like, it's not as big a game and it's, it just seems to have its own niche. Like, I yeah. think that was always an overblown topic, mate. There's like four or five topics that like, at this point, I don't know if you know the space that well, but essentially, do you know the sort of niches of Twitter, like the Manosphere and then yeah, like yeah. fucking money Twitter and stuff? If you're ever in those areas, it is famous that what happens is people just actually even have scheduled tweets that are like that it's like a, it's a classic like op, super standard conversation style like you know what do you think men or women who should be the boss you know be something like that you know that's like what the equivalent of these shit takes are like maybe we should rename the sides or hey you know what i think in cs it needs to be free to play that used to be another one by the way does everyone remember that one where we were promised if cs was free to play it'd be like league of legends Right, it has more players, but it hasn't like fucking got ten times more, has it? It got what, like one and a half times more or something? And then I'd even just point this out. This is where people don't think these things through. How are you going to complain that you need a way better matchmaking experience after letting a lot of shit cunts in for free? I wonder why matchmaking's garbage nowadays when it's free. So I think that those all those topics have just been exposed. It was just fucking talking points, weren't they? It's like politics. You may as well just be the guy on morning news just waffling while we're all having our coffee. But who knows if you're fucking talking out your ass or what you're just talking, aren't you? Oh, it's just pure cope from people who are invested into a game. And they're like, well, if we made the game better, then then that would draw players. But that's hard. And then also we have to admit that the game isn't perfect and like super good. Like the fact that you admit that it could be better is saying that there's a flaw in it to be corrected. And nobody wants to do that, especially if especially in a riots based ecosystem where if you criticize the game, you get shit canned out of the industry faster than you can blink. So, yeah, I don't know, man. That's just one of those things that like, especially like I, I think of the an analogy of like. The thing that we could do with CS2 is we could take CSGO and we could take the things which are not interesting, which would be like, you know, some of the economic status of the game, things that are just like rote tasks in a map. Like you got to throw your incendiary on overpass. Otherwise the T's will get free map control. It's like this thing you have to do every round you have an incendiary. Okay. I guess that's something that I have to learn now. And that, that's not interesting, right? Cause there's never really any real decision. Sometimes you can get a little mind gamey with it, but there's generally never any real decision of admitting that it's almost always, you have to do this if you can do it. Like it's always a good decision. And that's just binary, right? Nobody likes that kind of thing. It just doesn't lead to interesting things. So I kind of, I will analogize it, analogize it to uh, when you're in brood war and you're trying to micro your dragoons up a ramp and it just doesn't work properly because the unit is bugged basically and people are like wow this game is is very deep like i think it's the best rts we've had and i don't think that overcorrecting it to the degree that starcraft 2 did where they actually made the pathfinding worse in many respects where units just clump up that doesn't lead to a good game either but at least make the unit follow my order right like at least we can do that because then i can use my apm and my focus to do other more interesting things on the battlefield then imagine the pros who are playing protoss who don't have to spend all their apm building you know moving this unit up the ramp or whatever like imagine what they can do elsewhere they can do more interesting things and get us better games and more compelling games like that's the kind of thing i want for the cs pros too i don't want them using their economy and their mental focus and training this weird wacky jump throw that maybe isn't even something that should be in the game and and doing all this wacky stuff like abusing mechanics like the bug jump that big plan did at that one major and it's just like why why are we doing stuff like this right like we all kind of intrinsically understand that this doesn't need to be in the game it, do, it doesn't really add a lot yeah but here's but the problem for no go here's the obvious question no one asked as well no one thinks of these things I, I think laterally when people say i think what, what what side to this aren't we seeing here's what no one bothers bringing up so everyone just spent the last few weeks just on their their hands and knees 
politely, I'd say, given a fucking foot massage. Obviously, if we're impolite, we're where I'm from. I'd just say sucking that dick of fucking Valve devs, haven't they? Like, oh, they're amazing. The CSGO devs, you won't believe it. They even work for all the billions of dollars that we all pay them. And <laughs> You know, I've dedicated my whole life to promoting their game and they didn't spit in my face and let me have a go. Like, fucking hell, like, the, the pandering and the sniveling was pathetic. Here's the obvious question I have. So you're telling me, famous streamer, you're telling me, professional player, you went to Valve HQ and played the game. Did you ever stop for five minutes, even over coffee, and go, can you fix the economy of the game that's totally broken? And ruined? No, you never even did, did you? Never did for one second. In fact, those combos never came up. All you did is for free play test like a focus group, CS2 for Valve, as far as I can tell, and just big up everything they did. Because the weirdest thing is, people, you know, the way you can sort of tell, no matter what they say, people know you can't really talk to Valve, is, haven't you noticed how no one even actually suggests that we complain to Valve to change the economy? They suggest we do things we can do, like make it MR12, or yeah. get rid of pistol rounds. They don't ever suggest, like, why doesn't Valve just do it? Because we all know that's just a flight of fancy. Valve just see, Valve just genuinely seem like some, like, capricious old world god, who, like, maybe doesn't even communicate with humanity and just does whatever he wants whenever he feels like it. So if anything, you almost feel like you don't want to invoke them in case they just smite you for no reason. You just want to be like, well, it's all right. It's all okay, God. And then just figure shit out yourself, like in society as it were. So like, I just find that part wild because I get that people want the game different. Maybe people even wanted these smoke changes and graphical updates, but surely along the way, you also want to change some fundamental things that people didn't like about the game. You know, you would like, think. I think that's one that, that isn't that the biggest thing everyone's talked to death for the last year or so is like, hasn't the economy sort of killed games because they all last like fucking five hours long and have a million bosses and the, the break now we, cause now the problem is it's other side stuff too. Like now you have like a five minute break between bloody halves of a game. So like the game just keeps extending. It's, it's well, we're never going to address these problems by just making the game have cool smokes. Like someone's eventually got to put Val's feet to the fire. You'd assume. Eventually, Outsiders has to be punished for winning that major. You know, so basically my take. So it's the way they already just kicked that Norbert guy, and he's just been memory. <laughs> like, well, I won't give the obvious example of removing someone from history because that's a bit too on the nose right now, especially with the countries involved. But let's just say, yeah, he, now the joke is people just act like Norbert just never existed. He just rocked up. We barely knew his name beyond the fact he had a silly name. He won a world championship. They booted him, and no one get no one. I don't even give a fuck. No one gives a fuck. <laughs> I don't even know if Norbert does. I feel like Norbert's just like, whatever, got my majors, see ya. It's like, you know, yeah. what the, even is this? The Inter's move had more, you know, traction around <laughs> it. It did? Yeah. Yeah. Dude, way more people were outraged at that. Yeah, he hadn't yeah. even won the, it's not like he even won world, the world yeah. championship or anything, yeah. Yeah. Oh, man. I don't know. But yeah, I, I, to kind of add to the conversation, I think that, you know, um, with moving to the next game, uh, hopefully it, it streamlines all of like sort of where the bugs are at. I think that's one of the things with the smokes is that there's a few of these game breaking bugs in Go. Um, you know, the whole nade yes. behind the smoke showing silhouettes, one smoke inside another sometimes bugs out and again you can see silhouettes i think that they're just things that unfortunately were broken in source one so they i always you know, thought well, oh, as well by the way one ways were always a terrible thing for yeah, casual yeah, fans they just yeah. don't know that that exists they think you're just missing or but you know i agree there was, there's lots of flaws we just accept don't we yeah yes. yeah 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 um, so hopefully i think that you know things like that are going to change and i i do feel like they have found a really good uh area of attack as it were to get rid of all the the smoke bugs by completely changing the smokes out and making them you know uh sort of lifelike you know uh, uh, uh personifying them a little what what is the word yeah i think personifying is maybe where i'm at you know fluid volumetric is the word that's used in the video and all that kind of stuff um but it just feels like they they have a life of their own and uh that'll make things it's the way, more it's the way every person also within the next 48 yeah, hours yeah, was yeah. like yeah i like the year volumetric you've never used that word in your fucking life <laughs> no one even heard that word before they said it and i wanted to really set up explain a bit. what it meant either so. yeah yeah i, I wanted like to set up context. a little bit more you know before i just yeah. threw volumetric down just uh something a bit different i suppose but it, it but seems like it's caught on it seems like it is going to be uh what we're calling them i don't know i quite like dynamic smokes i feel like that's maybe that's a good uh, one you know yeah. a little bit of a better line for it but um but yeah so but do you like them in the game script yeah of course i think i think it's a cool change i think am i the only one as well who doesn't get like there's certain things about the way they showed those videos where i was like i wanted to just pause it and be like guys what are we actually excited about here like for example you know when they were trying to show the fact that the smoke just like a, a molotov sort of spreads a bit differently every time yeah, yeah. so they were showing that it can fill different shapes and if you remember you're going to see in your head the image as i say it. they were showing like you know you put it in a window it goes across then they showed really quickly that one where it was like a donut shape and it just made a circle like that and everyone was like "Ooh!" it's like wait a minute 
what's good about that? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. what? That's just like we're all just pawns at this point. So that's just some weird gimmick. Like, well, first of all, when would there ever be a donut shape like that? And then secondly, why is that good? Because as far as I can tell, that just looked like when you put some spray cream from a can, like, shh, yeah. like what? Like what? It, it just shows that we're all fucking, we're all marks for this shit, boys. Yeah. We all just well, want it to be good, don't be, we? It's supposed <laughs> to be a callback to Anubis A site, but oh, is that the logic? Because there's loads but, of those well, like it, columns in, or whatever. In Anubis A site, it's bigger, so it wouldn't fill the whole thing with one smoke, but it would definitely look exactly like a, a whipped cream as you're talking about. So yeah, yeah. first thing I thought of. Yeah. yeah, and only only probably when it, when they fail, but you know they're going to be conventional smokes. I don't know that you know Mirage execute on uh, on A site is going to be any different, anything like that. You know, so uh, we'll we'll see, we'll see. The shooting theory is kind of interesting, but I, I just and it's only at the edges. Like guys, we were so confused when this yes. initial announcement dropped. I thought you could stand in the smoke and shoot yeah. through it to get a clear. Yeah, right. You have to be around the edges. Also, I thought HE grenades just deleted them, but they come back. It did look like that on the first video yeah. they showed, yeah. but yeah, it doesn't. Yeah, true. Yeah. Yeah. So, like, I think maybe, you know, the, it was t toned down a little bit, you know, since the... the I mean, all I'm going to say is this, guys. I think everyone's making too small a deal out of this. In uh, in protest against how fucked up the modern smokes are, Taz, who Vertus Pro invented those Mirage smokes, has just retired from the game I protest. Like... <laughs> Why is everyone not making a big deal of it? He's just disgusted with what they've done with the smoke technology, and he's just decided I'm out. So you know, he's created a monster, and he has to he has to make a stand. Yeah, it's ridiculous. I mean, I thought that was a bit weird. Uh, the fact that Honoris ceased their operations and Taz retired. Something must have gone down. I don't know the details, but it's just like they were on the rise. They were on the come up along with. I mean, time. I will say that it is like financially probably the worst period in the last like fifteen sure. years. Yeah, 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 yeah. And all like sponsors are just like cut the budget. So yeah. there's probably some of that involved in it. Or they just couldn't get another round of funding. It's like the heroic one. People act like for heroics like out of money. No, it's just they they need a further rounds. Like those companies. Yeah. They don't make money, so the way you get the money through is you get more investment, you sell more of the company, you get more angel investors. So that all that meant is they were just in trouble in the future, which maybe isn't even a problem now, who knows? Well, you know the significance of names, obviously, is something you bring up. Angel investors, well, their absence kind of tells us we're in some kind of economic hell, doesn't it? Oh, it's kind of weird how that works linguistically I, I will say oh by the way the obvious joke i missed when we were talking about phase and potentially winning a second major is that that org fucking needs it clearly i was surprised they won the grand slam before shutting down so who knows what's going to happen in that front and obviously we just saw tsm also cease operations this it seems like uh things are going to be very very different i wasn't expecting that that would happen because obviously tsm made an announcement earlier that they were going to enter into csgo by mm. a, a world championship contender team and everybody speculated are they going to try to seize cloud nine or maybe their world championship is like stretched out and they're just going to be like well bad news eagles or some you know some org that like is more within the reach of, of potentially being acquired but it looks like nobody nobody's going to be on the tsm banner i love TSM. people like that by the way where they don't even have like the fucking ambition to dream big enough where they were like, oh, TSM's coming in. I hope they get Bad News Eagles. Like, dream a bit bigger for fuck's sake, will you? <laughs> <laughs> Give me a break, man. They're the guys where, like, some billionaire could be like, I'll buy you anything you want. You'd be like, the the bigger Snickers? Yeah. I feel like Snickers <laughs> yeah. right now. Just go for some fucking Belgian chocolate at that point. I'd be like, you know, just fucking level up. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I, I think the the TSM one's kind of a wild one, though. I don't really know. Uh, I guess the FTX thing as well is is probably holding them back a fair just bit. Sunk them. Um, they were waiting on some cash to come in, and it just didn't. Which again is one of the the funnier stories of uh, the the past couple of years for sure. The whole uh, FTX crumbling and you know TSM the guy's name, name was Bankman. Like, am I missing <laughs> how has nobody brought that up more often? I mean, like, you know, you had like Mr. Medicare bring it up as a joke, but like literally bank man, guys. Like, also, on, the man. thing that's mad to me is a lot of gamers don't know this, but like there's this, there's a real story that was verified. People looked up like, you know, in league, you can look up people's ranks and all the yeah. match history. What he used to do while he was doing his business calls for Reelsgrave was he would play solo queue in league and he was like f perma stock in the lowest ranks. He was out his shit at league Wrong after three thousands of games made and this is the guy the people who had an org from league of legends put their whole fucking future on and lcs did as well yeah. so essentially in your space your only domain expertise is the game league of legends someone has proven he is objectively appalling at understanding even the most basic concepts and you go well i don't know anything about finance either so I guess you can just have all my money and look after it like oh bloody hell yeah. yeah, I think you deserve it at that point, isn't that? Wouldn't that be another fucking fable for young children to learn from? Like, that's mm. a parable and half right there, isn't it? 
Yeah, well, the, the times are coming. Are Hopefully, uh, you know, the, the hard times that make hard people or whatever, uh, they're on the way. So we'll see. We'll see what happens. But, so uh, get hard, Scriv. Get real hard. Uh, <laughs> not touching it with a barge pole, to be fair. What about that? What about the old school um, GB James line for Team Liquid? Remember, make a play that gets you dick hard. By the way, that didn't age well at the time, but that's going to age way, way worse in the future. <laughs> yeah, don't worry already, about that. Don't I think worry it's about already that. aged pretty poorly. To be I know. Yeah, I don't know. But, um, but yeah. Because uh, that is just like, excuse me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The fuck? <laughs> oh, you know, your interview with that guy always shocked me because his photo can- like quality was like, it was like he was a living photograph or something. It was really wacky. I don't know. People might forget about that, but if they go back and look. His yeah, yeah, did reflections up. with him. Yeah. So. Not a bad show, not a bad show. But yeah, so I, I think, you know, coming back to the CS2 conversation, I, I do feel like, you know, this game uh, is is set up to succeed, I think. Uh, there's not going to be too many changes, but we kind of yeah. pick up where we're leaving off. The, the thing is as well with like the big game change that possibly could have happened or weapon changes or whatever, it would be nice to get an extra gun or something like that, you know, that is uh, sure. something a bit fresher, something a bit... Uh, more different i i think maybe having some variety in like the smgs for example that they're you know uh, it's mainly just the mp9 it would be kind of cool to see something like the ump come back in or just a completely fresh gun that actually does something because uh, again our you know concentration we don't see um over even 50 percent of those types of guns i get it with the rifles because rifle you know you're spending the full money there's always going to be one that's the best but i think something with the smgs something um in in that area you know to keep the game a bit more fresh would be kind of cool um so we'll we'll see we'll see so a few changes i think would be nice uh and a bit of a shake-up would be nice but maybe not right out of the gate is the thing because i think again this comes back to the conversation around the game needing to be uh up to scratch and needing to be ready to go by launch which is only in a few months time they've been working on it for yeah. a couple of years apparently and uh if if they can't produce a game that functions similarly to the way that go is i think that they will uh you know really 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 drop the ball on it so um because that's something with you know i didn't play much source i didn't play much 1.6 or, or or any um but i i do feel like the thing that made those games um sort of uh, uh have the lag of of people going into a new game and obviously with source the vast majority of people actually stayed on 1.6 was these sort of big uh gameplay changes wall banging uh the the way that the nades function things like this and i think that they they obviously want to avoid that fact and you don't want cs2 coming out and then everyone going, well, CSGO was better. We need to go back. Um, so I, I do feel like this game hopefully is set up and it looks pretty good from, uh, you know, this being a beta test. It's only on one map or whatever, but it feels like the game, uh, as you said, Thorin, th functions very similarly to, to the way that Go does and the gunplay feels very similar. Um, and I think by all accounts, that is a good sign for me. With any luck, what we'll see is just a, a nice and neat, tidy uh, my, you know migration over. Obviously, they... They transferred all the skins, which is a big deal because microtransactions. And obviously, they've uh, basically laid the groundwork for the maps. The, be the best thing about the engine upgrade is the fact that it lets you have more content. Obviously, data miners already found a bunch of stuff referencing an operation. Um, so yeah, maybe we'll get... like That's one angle that I could see a lot of casual players sticking with the game long term, is if there are repeated operations like over and over and over again, because it's a lot easier to add content now. And, um, you know, operations are obviously where a lot of maps were also rotated in. I don't know if that'll be the same thing now. They seem to have a very different process for that. Uh, but who knows? Like, maybe what we'll see is gun overhauls or new guns or whatever uh, later on in the game's lifespan as operations start kicking in. So, I mean, it would be one way, I guess, if they launched the game with an operation. Maybe that's actually what they're planning. So, you never know. That could be it. But... Honestly, I mean, the last couple operations were like, kill 20 chickens on Dust 2. It's like, fuck you, dude. Like, why am I doing that? It's a nice content you got there. So, yeah, I don't know. With any luck, though, it is just, as we're all saying, pretty much CSGO with a new coat of paint. And uh, obviously the smoke changes, and, and who knows? I mean, they're going to rework maps. You saw Overpass is apparently different. There was a little bit of sh uh, light shed on that on the uh, Talk Encounter episode where they had a lot of the p people who tested the game uh, talk about how Overpass was done. But uh, And they also had Yanko there for whatever reason. So shout out Yanko. He, he, also, he wasn't testing, but he was there like going, wow, that was cool. Probably had something really to say about there. Nico, some sort of excuse about what Nico thinks about the game, I assume. There so. you go, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Filtered it out. You know? I don't so know. He's got his own niche. He knows what he's doing. The pro players on the side of CS2, now that they've streamed it a lot, I mean, 
it, 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 we're getting mixed signals about like the tick rate, but it also seems like they've generally been like, yeah, this is fine. You know, it works out. I mean, there's some complaints. Obviously they had the fucking wall hack command in, in the game for a while. So I don't know what was up with that, but beyond that, I mean, the pros seem to like it. So that kind of points towards what Thorne was saying earlier about how this game is probably just going to be a, a migration over. Uh, unfortunately, that means the economy won't change probably, but who knows? Maybe the smoke change will end up being way more impactful at the top end than we suspect. And maybe there'll be more counterplay. People buy an HEs out the wazoo so that they can actually clear those smokes. You might see some meta developments change. So it'll definitely be interesting to see the PGL major in the next year. Uh, I know actually majors are a topic that you made a video on recently, Thorne, talking about the inconsistent nature of how they were doled out across the year. We start off with three whittled down to two obviously the pandemic hit okay now we got all this other stuff now we only have one this year um my my brain tells me blast is probably seething because their last major i mean on the one hand they get the benefit of it being the last major that's a lot of pressure because now you really got to deliver this last major's got to be huge but at the same time they also have to get their big event undercut by the news and announcement of cs2 which to me as soon as cs2 launched i was thinking man blast must be like this is our major like this is we were trying to like do this first major we've ever done now it's also the last major of csgo and we have to deal with the fact that like maybe people are just going to skip this one in their head and, and forget about it because cs2 is about around the corner and stuff so i don't know what the dynamics are over there i'm sure that they're going to try their hardest to to put on a good product like they usually do although admittedly i think you've already started to see in the calendar as like there are very few events that they even have in the calendar have shown they're not necessarily operating on full strength for those early events leading up to this event. Like the world finals was kind of scattershot. It felt like that was at the end of last year. And then their opening events so far this year have kind of been like, eh. I mean, nobody really cares about online competition, I guess is one of the main problems. And that's what's going on right now. Uh, but at the very least, EG got a win. And it was just announced EG will be replacing detonate at the RMR. So they still actually <laughs> managed to slide their way in there, guys. They might actually contend for the, for the major event, which I mean, all right, well, we get to see watch them lose some more, I guess. So there's that. The thing is, I though, guess. if I'm blast, what you're talking about, I would just make that, I would lean into it. I would make the whole theme like it's the last major of yes, CSGO. Yeah. I would even do like part of the advertising scheme is like, will Simple get two? Can Carrigan get two? What about Nico? I'd make that like literally part of it, build into the storyline, especially because if you do it right, the cleverest move you could do, and this would fuck ESL so hard, is if you make it feel like, even though you're just saying it's the last major, you almost make it feel like it's the last CSGO. Yes, go event and it wouldn't be of course there'd still be like some events after that yes. that would be like esl for example before the game ends but well, you could just make matters, it yeah. you could make it seem like it was so like all the casuals were like yeah well that's the end of that i'll be back next year you know like you could do that if you wanted to be an absolute cunt so i would just lean into that for sure of course well you know what you talk about esl and comparing them like i can't believe that more of hubbub was not made about the fact that phase could win the grand slam and epl like am i missing mad, something? It? like yeah, they mad. still don't do it like we were we were shitting on them earlier on in the previous events because like phase dude was they didn't even to... do it for the major remember yeah, they could I have know. won it real they didn't even do it with yeah. some, like a teaser for that it's crazy yeah. to me yeah so there was no real hype or storyline or expectation based around that and then they were in the finals and it was like yeah they could make history isn't that so cool i mean i know it's like the toned down event but also, like, come on. <laughs> yeah, I know they, they I'll didn't give you another angle concert. that's mad to me, right? When you have that dynamic, which, again, didn't end up getting done, which is when the team that could win the Grand Slam makes the fourth final that they're going to win, yeah. if someone beats them, they get the denial for the 100K. I would have both. I would have the gold bars there and I'd have the 100K there. And then the premise is it's like whoever wins gets to go and get their prize. So if you're like Cloud9, you're also seeing like a stack of like 100K plus whatever second place money was, probably 100K as well. But I'd have done some like whole thing as well. Because remember, thematically, you want to build up the idea that this is what they're competing for. You want it to basically be like in wrestling where they have the fucking ladder match with the belt right there, you know. And the idea is it's just within your grasp and you can just reach out. Like that's the whole vibe you're going for. Because I thought it was mega disappointing how little fanfare they put around that like look gold bars is cool getting a million on a website of earnings is cool but like you could do so much more about that you know you want it to be some like super momentous moment in history whereas they seem to sort of quite frankly it's wild because they don't even seem to put much effort in like they seem to just not care that much ESL like they make it like some side shit that should be the, the reason I thought the grandson was genius when they initially implemented this is only ESL events yeah. it's the way you make yourself like the premier part of the circuit I even think on some level the way you know they've succeeded is like you said Scriv no one really give a fuck about Blast World Finals nor have they ever Blast World Finals just feels like Blast 4 Finals but not in Copenhagen 
You know what yeah. I mean? Like yeah, it doesn't have any true. special feel to it. It's just a, not, a normal event. It doesn't. It doesn't feel like any of the world championships in Counter Strike, even though you could do that. So I think both the TOs have their own sort of blind spots. They sometimes just don't seem to even bother looking towards. Yeah, we'll we'll see. I think that you know, again, uh, the prestige of the you know the Grand Slam's got to be far more valuable than the money itself and the gold bars and things like that. I just absolutely, think, yeah. You know, the ability to to in so many different tournaments, different environments, different you know, some's heavily land, some's crowded, some's not. Uh, some indeed are a, a major, so there's kind of a double header there for you to find success. I think that things like that need to be played up a little bit more. And again, it it's. Um, yeah, it felt like it was completely overlooked until they sort of won it and there was that uh, segment at the end where they had a few beers and they all had the gold bars and they had a, a you know mass interview with the entire team. That's when it felt like it was really cemented and uh, they obviously pulled it off so it matters a bit more. But the whole kind of twist obviously has got it twice now and, and that was uh, not really played up to either. So yeah, the, the grand slam of uh, ESL... Uh, or well intel uh is uh, a little overlooked um and and it feels kind of strange i think to to have that um in the game to to your point though pronogo i think um yeah the uh, the blast major a lot of people are putting a lot of pressure on it already i think before cs2 was even announced a lot of people were saying you know this is their chance to really prove what they've got they've always had the better production the better they themselves stream or said, whatever. you guys have to remember when this was announced they said we are going to put on the best csgo major now it's also the last csgo major this was like months ago that they announced it saying that, that exact line so yeah you're right like a lot of pressure was already on them right yeah and i think that that's very scary and i don't know if that's something uh i i think they'll still perform to be honest i think it's going to be in a great city it's a little bit you know weird maybe if you are there it's going to be in french that's obviously the one big thing that always stands out in the the french stadiums but um yeah i, I still feel like they are going to deliver a really good major it just kind of has uh, a bit more of an angle to it and I, I don't know i think that leaning into uh the last cs major is probably the way to cs go major as that's going to be a bit confusing for a few months um is is probably the better way to to play into it um but it's it's really quite a tough remit that they've got i think the teams are not necessarily set up in the best possible way uh because there's a, a, a lot of inconsistencies kind of with where the teams are at so you can't paint storylines as effectively but for me i i do feel like this uh major should be a really solid one i think that blast have got the capability to to prove it um one, one of the maybe questions that we could move into if there's no more sort of points on that one how do we feel about mm -hmm. pgl getting you know yet another major uh into you know into cs2 is is kind of the thing i don't know I, I nothing against pgl necessarily i suppose the first major that they had back was a little wacky in places uh with the audio and all that classic stuff uh the second one felt pretty good though to be honest i think antwerp's one of the better majors in in recent history um and obviously had the games there as well but i i don't know again i'm, I'm not a fan of having you know the same sort of operators we were maybe going to get one out in asia was rumored but that doesn't happen um and it's also you know it's going to be in denmark which again is a city uh sorry a country that has been uh played up to cs for quite a while and it's not like it's a new fresh area that's the one thing maybe rio had going for it is that it's like an area that we've not been to in a long time you get to see how the crowd functions a little differently and we did get a couple games there where it was kind of exciting um but in in denmark that feels like it's something that's been sort of done and dusted quite a lot so uh open to the panel uh how, how do we feel about Denmark and uh, PGL being the the first CS2 major. What do you think, Perogo? You can go first, Matt. Well, I think it's odd as a choice for Denmark to get. Well, it's just weird because Blaster in Paris instead of Denmark, which is obviously yeah. like that's their home country, that's their home event, that's their home stadium is the Royal Arena. So that's a bit weird to me. But and also maybe that's another point of consternation. PGL is swooping in on that. I think Semler made that point on the recent by the numbers. But the the thing that I get out of this is okay, PGL obviously pretty buddy buddy with Valve, especially with all the Dota two stuff. Their last major was much better than their the major that came before that, the preceding one. Uh, I think they'll put on a good show. I mean, the question is how spectator ready and tournament ready will CS2 actually be by then? That's like the main thing that could be out of PGL's control, but still obviously have a significant impact on the event. So yeah, I'm not sure. I think I look at stuff like that and I think to myself, you know, how are we going to attempt to make this kind of event really kick off? How is PGL going to market around it? And that's an angle that I feel like they've already, they've always been a little bit, I mean, I'll, 
there, there's the whole angle of like what they were talking about in uh, you know before the second major came in, which is obviously why a lot of members of talent chose not to work with them, right? But like even beyond that messaging, it's just like okay, their first major was the first CS:GO major in 4K. That was something that they mentioned about Stockholm a lot, right? Is like this is going to be the first one that we really do push the envelope in that respect. Their previous major in uh, PGL Krakow was obviously one of those events that they try to push the AR angle a lot. Maybe they had like their own HUD as well from memory that they, they were trying to like push as in, in an additional sense. But I just feel like I come away from those events feeling like whether they were good majors or bad majors or awkward majors with the production, they were still just kind of majors and not like their own unique thing. I didn't come away feeling like this is a really big landmark moment. I mean, the the one of the trophies, I forget which one, it was probably the Stockholm one was just like really an affront to my eyes. But beyond that, it's like, I can't really remember anything other than the games themselves, which maybe, you know what, fair fucks, maybe that's actually all you need. But I can't help but feel like there should be something different and more pop and pop and circumstance around CS2, uh, especially considering that's the one, but you know what, they lucked out. Denmark being the, the country maybe is like a nice little way for them to say, hey, we had so much success in CSGO, so like here's a good selection. I'm not sure what thoughts would have gone into that one, so I can't speak to that motivation-wise. But yeah, I mean, I'm coming away from it like hopefully optimistic, you know what I mean? Like my, minorly optimistic, like ho hopeful that it'll be good. But at the same time, like PGL has a rocky relationship with majors really i think the one in antwerp was probably the only one that people would broadly say is good and maybe the krakow ones get un unfairly pilloried here because of the fact that it was obviously a whack finals but beyond that i, I don't know like just kind of like okay well let's see what pgl can do hopefully they do better than stockholm and krakow and you know but also better than antwerp even though antwerp wasn't bad it's just like we need something really good to kick things off but right, here we go prologo watch watch and learn mate this is where I earn the big bucks. So as the esports historian, I'll give everyone a brief history lesson. You might not know this, but technically, PGL, in some context, has been associated with four of the majors in CSGO. Some of these wow. details will actually go a little bit over people's heads. They won't know this is behind-the-scenes stuff. One is ESL Cologne 2016, an ESL major. It was held in Cologne in their home country in the Lanxess. A lot of people don't know. At the time, because PGL was the best at observing, they handled the observing for that major. And famously, the observing even for that one was a little bit sus in the playoffs. Remember, that was the one where they missed the 1v2 of St. Paul. All that jazz, right? Well, basically, Basically, I remember there was actually backlash at that time where it was like ESL sort of like let people know either on Reddit or in like some sort of media angle, like, oh, we didn't handle that, like, and sort of like threw PGL into it, right? And spoiler, the people behind PGL, because they're super old school, and I'm talking really super old school, like early 2000s when I was in starting in esports, they've always had as an enemy ESL because ESL through Turtle was doing early CPLs and stuff, and they were the other big operator in the space. In fact, they were the biggest operator even in the early 2000s. So there was that one. Then right after, obviously, oh, sorry, before, the year before, people will forget this. DreamHack closed the poker, which took place in Romania. Go look it up. Technically says DreamHack and PGL organized that. Because as far as I know, it was like DreamHack staff and like crew or whatever. And then because it was PGL's country, they sort of worked with them. And at the time, that was because everyone was trying to battle in coalitions against ESL. Remember, 2015 was the year when ESL bought ESEA and the rumor was like, maybe they're just going to do a um, monopoly type exclusive circuit which Richard famously reported on and sort of was able to stop by word of doing like a sort of like get the word out there just beforehand and then the right people were able to step in famously Valve was supposedly on some vacation and they quickly came back to sort of say like, hey stop that like you can't do a circuit so the first two which they were tangentially connected with not that great had some issues or they got th sort of thrown under the bus a bit then we came to their first real major the PGL Krakow one which at the time was the worst CSGO major ever I wasn't there but I heard not only did they have tech problems repeated like people were literally even saying like the PCs were dodgy on the first few days but then yes unfortunately it also had the dreaded scenario a bit like the classic fucking face it major where just a lot of the playoff matches were shit and it wasn't a very interesting sort of conclusion for people basically they didn't feel like it was as exciting in the playoffs because I always said about CS events the silliest thing about CS go events is there's a lot of luck in how well people event remember the event because even if you fuck up every aspect of production f format invite everything as long as the last i'd say like from as long as the semis and the final are really good matches everyone will forgive you everyone because we'll just watch those matches and we'll end with such a great memory we'll go yeah it was pretty good so that one already was a bust right then you came to stockholm 
contender for worst major ever in terms of things like certain sound aspects moving between the venues. Are we in Stockholm? Are we not in Stockholm? And then he did Antwerp, which I'll give you Antwerp. I think it was just a good major. Like, I don't think there's any real complaints about that one. So if you look, they haven't got a great track record of working with the majors. And unfortunately, I suspect I know why. It's actually not, by the way, the angle someone might think, which is like, in the modern climate, I'd actually say right now, especially, some of these sentiments are almost rising up again. People might just want to think, well, it's because it's in bloody Eastern Europe and, you know, everyone's corrupt over there and they're all just bloody, like, doing a shit job. And then it's one guy, like, just lying to his boss, like, yeah, I can go handle that, but he can't. No, no, it's not some, like, ridiculous bureaucracy. As far as I can tell, that's the whole metric by which PGL can do these majors and why they're always the ones aggressively bidding to get a major. Because what I've heard is they're one of those events that basically, I've seen this happen. They will have one person do two people's jobs. That happens in production. As in, when ESL would have two people to do that job, and sometimes even three, they'll have one. Well, you can already see how the person who hires one can crush the, the margins for, for how much the expenses are in a way the other guy can't. Then, add in, look, ESL themselves already did this, guys. They hired all the Polish people. But in the past, ESL would have a guy from Germany doing that job in Cologne. Whereas you're also, as PGL, you bring your own guy from Romania who comes from an economy that was cheaper, doesn't require the same money, also doesn't have the same opportunities, quite frankly. He's not in the like wider Western Anglosphere world of esports. He has to just work for PGL or someone else in Romania, you just have essentially, you can crush a lot of the margins. The downside is it's going to make the event probably worse. Like it's going to basically mean that the analogy, if you want to use one, here's a classic CS analogy. If you don't know why servers suck on registration in Counter Strike, it's nearly always that you've got a really cheap server host that's put loads of virtual servers, as many as you can fit, on one PC. So he's taken one server PC and he's put like 40 instances of CS servers. And what that means is when they're all full, the PC itself just can't run that many instances at max quality, like the RAMs get affected. And so things like the hit registration gets out of whack. If you actually want to make the best possible experience, what you do is put the least amount of servers as you can put onto one, but you charge like a premium price. And then the idea is you play because the quality is going to feel crisp and amazing. Like essentially, if you run a, a major... The problem is, because Valve, as far as I know, only provides some costs and the prize pool, you pay everything else. Essentially, they're actually incentivizing people to sort of gamble against each other. Like, it's like those scenarios you hear in the coding world, where someone comes back to a crew of people that are already worn out from programming, and they tell them, yeah, bad news. We've got to have it done in half the time, but with no extra money. So you're all just working like triple overtime, and you just do it, because that's just life. Like... But imagine that the reason your guy got the deal is because he got he went, oh, right. What if I do it for half as long for half the money? Like, look, that might get the deal, but it'll make it like way harder circumstances to produce the product. So unfortunately, I do get the vibe. PGL leans into that. That's why I actually did think it was really distasteful that they implied at least to us. I think they maybe even said this publicly. They've implied they think the business is great. Like they make money from it or something or things are yeah, great. Yeah. That killed me when I heard that because I could have forgiven them if it was like, this is our only way to compete with like German massive companies. Like we have to sort of, you know, do a lot of hard work and we have to work for less and we have to do more, but you know, it's worth it for the vision. No, they made it sound like they just sort of like wreck their own employees. So that's one of the reasons I can't really handle the output being sauce. If it's like Antwerp, I'm cool. If it's like the other ones, I think that's a bit whack. And unfortunately that excuse doesn't fly with me but i also put some of it on valve this isn't ti like they don't pay everything themselves they don't just cover all the costs that'd be different if valve paid everything then we could just judge all these tos as harshly as possible we could be like that wasn't a good enough job like you know blast would do a better job on this aspect and esl would do a better job on this aspect but if you know the business parts it makes it all super muddy in my opinion so i actually think i've got a quick bit on the denmark thing i actually think for real scriv that is just classic esports pettiness because think <laughs> about this so when they got the major again after all those years off since 2017 pgl got that stockholm major where did they try and hold it in stockholm which was the heart of mtg the company that owned esl i've just told you they're massive rivals with esl so you're gonna go right i'll tell you what no one's ever held a major in stockholm remember they held it in john shipping they never held it in stockholm capital Suite. i'm gonna come to your territory and i'm gonna host it right in your face in front of your office basically not literally but metaphorically then i get another major that one's antwerp cool third major first one in cs2 well you know what we're coming to denmark right in your motherfucking face blast i'm gonna be in your house in your venue 
I think there is some of that, mate. Because it, logically, it doesn't make that much sense if you are PGL. Think about it. Why the fuck would you ever be going to Sweden and Denmark if you're from a poorer country like Romania where you want to crush the margins? The joke is, you know, you know it'd actually make way more financial success to go to, like, Serbia, Poland. You'll make The margins will be way better for you. So to me, I don't see what upside there is to go into those other countries, aside from, unless Valve naively, which I don't think they do, get what we get, which is that, well, Sweden and Denmark contribute a lot to CS history. I don't think Valve know that shit, mate. I've told everyone the story before. At the beginning of CS go, a Valve dev said to my face that if Kaylee cheated, existence must have known because he was sat next to him. I remember looking at him like, what are you talking about, you daft cunt? Someone slap the shit out of this guy's face, will you? What you, the fuck is he talking about? I actually, people don't know, this is true. I left the meeting and told the Dreamback guy, don't ever put me in a room with those idiots again. And just fucking left. Because that's just how swagged out I am. I actually am like a character out of Entourage or something. So no, anyway, to bring it all back. I also think, by the way, that whole angle that we did from the Rio one of like, and if it's huge, we should have it in a big stadium. I think everyone's missing the point on that. You don't want that. The reason why this could actually be a banger in Denmark, by the way, you saw it when the Royal Arena's full. As long as you stop people cheating, you don't need, you don't actually need a huge crowd for CS because it's on the, on the big screen. And if people don't know by now, the reason Stockholm sucked is they just didn't do the crowd mics properly. Yeah. If you do the crowd mics properly, you can have a thousand people. It could sound mega. I actually think for CS, all you need is a filled room. It doesn't even have to be 10,000. It could be 5,000. People don't know. Illegal Atlanta was like 5,000 people in a theater. But everyone thinks it was the shit because it was really packed and there was all crowd sections and people chanting and it looked like when the players came in, whoa, this place is packed. All you need is the, it, the illusion of it being packed. So I actually think Denmark could be a bag of spot. It is a spot we wanted a major for many, many years. I am a little bit worried about the cheating angle. Like if Heroic's playing, will they shout? If Erat Strauss is playing, will they shout? But you can also solve that as an, an organizer. Like if people don't know, you really can just have people. They did this at E-League at every live broadcast of E-League when they would have that one on like a Friday when it was like the live show there was a woman in the break and before we went live would literally walk in front of the crowd and say to everyone like I know you're all excited about the game and you want to cheer for your favourite players but please don't say anything when it destroys the competitive integrity of the game don't say things when people are in 1v1s they would just tell the crowd this now look they could also say it which you would in the, at the event we'll kick you out if you do it but you try to do like this the softly softly angle but you just you just slide that in there sort of like because if people don't know, guys, if they can earn the fucking Australian Open with drunken Australian people, get them all to be quiet while you serve in tennis, you definitely can figure this out in EA Sports, guys. Like, there's no way. It's not some mystery. Oh, how can we stop them all? Shout that. You can fix it. So I actually think to bring it all back, I am mad sus about BGL. I don't know how good a job they'll do, but I don't dislike the idea of an event in Denmark. And to kick off the game, it does sound like a pretty unique sort of way to start CS2. Sure. Yeah, may maybe uh, towards the tail end of uh, CSGO, you could argue that Denmark has become uh, a bit of a home of Counter-Strike. To, to, oh, that's fair. Know. Yeah, yeah. I, I think maybe Sweden before it, but with the Astralis run. And, you know, we obviously, we've had some Astralis and uh, Danish brands and all this kind of stuff run. Thing. They did a thing at McDonald's a few years ago, I think, and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, I, I feel like the Counter-Strike is, uh, is there um, and they get help from the government or whatever you can set up like uh esports houses and all this sort of stuff so it, it certainly feels like we might get a little bit of political intervention we might not get oh you're also right i hadn't thought of that angle that's actually also very likely like you already saw this with this paris one where like literally macron himself was like involved yeah, yeah. with the announcement yeah the implication because as you say we already know through blast in the past and through that royal arena they've literally been like the government have previously given them money and given them even if it's just tax breaks there's another reason actually why you might go to a country to be fair if the if the if the government understand it's a big deal to have a major there they might actually give you a load of deals like you're saying maybe they give you a deal like the stadium's cheaper sometimes remember this if people don't know as far as I know, the main reason ESL was ever in that sport deck in Katowice is because it was free. They were just getting it from the local area because they sold the local area, not incorrectly. Like, we're going to bring a load of tourism. There'll be a load of fans will come from Germany and Hungary and all the surrounding countries. And also, you'll get all this attention on Katowice. That no one... So that that's a real angle. That's a real world concern. That might actually be a factor that tipped it in favor of Denmark. You're right. If they get some sort of break, why not? Yeah, and I, I feel like it's a, a good country to have it in, you know, like I say, with the, the stage of where the Counter-Strike is at and uh, uh, Carrigan as well has got the representation. So I think there's an awful lot of that uh, with, with Denmark being a, a really strong suit for um, for the country. But yeah, maybe PGL a little bit a little bit sus, like you say. And uh, so so far, you know, with ones uh, in recent history as well, they I, I will say that um, Stockholm, 
was a bit of a letdown in that sense that it was the first major we had back and they uh, couldn't really nail it. They they couldn't even half nail it, to be fair, in, in places. So um, they did. They yeah, that's did. the big thing that I would have some concerns about is that this this CS2's first major is going to be a benchmark by which all future majors are judged against sure. and at the same time will be compared inevitably to the greatest majors of CSGO. And are we seeing a level up? Are we seeing at least parity between the best ones we had in CSGO versus this first one in CS2? So if you were going to try to really put your best foot forward, I don't know that PGL is the company to do that with. So that my take anyway. Yeah, we'll we'll see. We'll see. They definitely picked it up. Antwerp was pretty good, to be honest. So they they did turn it around uh, pretty quickly. And I don't know, it was not only was it the sort of first CS major back. It was also one of the first uh, LAN events in in full fruition. So maybe just by virtue of not doing it for so many years, and uh, you never really know what what goes on behind the scenes, whether it is fully PGL or whether it was the venue that they were in with sort of crowd mics and stuff like that, not being able to set them up properly um as as one of the big takeaways that people had you know with there not being a crowd uh, uh sound that you know filled out the casting booth yeah. as it were so maybe um but yeah cool i think i'm i'm pretty happy with that to be honest with you you know we've uh hit about an hour 20 we've had a good conversation about cs2 and where things are going and uh once again it's always a pleasure to to have you on thorin so thank you very much for your time and uh no problem there. yeah all good we'll have you on again i'm sure nonetheless folks that is going to be it for another episode of the off angle we'll catch you again next week <laughs> <laughs> You're going to love this video right here. You're going to love it. <laughs> Check it out right now.